Help Midvision keep bringing you material by becoming a Patreon member, as well as PayPal. Like, share, subscribe, and comment. Join the Patreon to get early access to videos and check out the website. We are Myth Vision. Welcome back to the channel, Myth Vision Podcast. Your host, Derek Lambert. Don't forget www.mythvisionpodcast.com. We got the new website set up. We're working on it. We're getting it developed. Make sure you guys show us some love. Go down in the description. I'm going to want you guys to check out our guest material. He has written a couple books, but Russell Gamirkin is an author. He, the one we're going to discuss today is Barosis and Genesis, Manitho and Exodus, Hellenistic Histories, and the Date of the Pentateuch. And he has written Plato and the Creation of the Hebrew Bible. So I've read that one first and working backwards, went to his 2006 publication. They call it the Green Book because it's full of riches. Um, are you interested in the dating of the Hebrew Bible? Most scholars believe the Hebrew Bible was constructed hundreds of years before the Septuagint. Sometime maybe around Ezra or Josiah, the, there's a reform that takes place and they're using history historiographical reasoning and believe it was made up of four sources j e p and d or d and p this is called the the documentary hypothesis what if the hebrew bible wasn't as old as we suppose in this series we're going to do a few video clips based on his book barosis and genesis manitho and exodus in this series russell gamirkin will be giving a case where the hebrew bible was developed so to speak five minutes before the Septuagint Greek translation was written in Alexandria. Could the Hebrew Bible be a Hellenistic work? Are there problems with the documentary hypothesis? We will wrestle with this in Barosis and Genesis, Manitho and Exodus. And with that, welcome to the channel. Welcome back, Russell Gamirkin. I'm very happy to be here. I'm glad you're here too. Uh, I'm getting a little jealous of seeing you on these other channels, man. And. Uh, <laughs> I'm just happy to get this information out, and you've doing a, a fantastic job. Uh, you're well, hitting people you're, in France, I think, or where is that? Somewhere in Africa. France, Africa, all French-speaking countries. But you were one of the very first uh, to interview me, so I appreciate that. I'm lucky. I'm lucky. Yeah, uh, Dragon Squad is where I actually found you. So, in terms of uh, listening to you, so you were you were hitting them with them daggers, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So you open this chapter up and, and the, this book, period, with, uh, of course, showing your, your wife love. You know, I love you so much, honey, and, and uh, this is written for you. And I don't blame you. You're a romantic. So in, in chapter one, I'm going to read something. It's from your book, but for our audience to keep up with. This is important that I build this up for the basic person, the the typical person like me off the street who's not going to know maybe some of these terms, they're not going to really be able to track the argument. I've heard plenty of shows with you and sound bites that sounded great, but did not di didn't follow the development of your thinking. And I think it's important to break it down so a six year old, so to speak, can understand it. And chapter one, methodology and history of scholarship. This book proposes a new theory, and it sure does regarding the date and circumstances of the composition of the Pentateuch. The central thesis of this book is that the Hebrew Pentateuch was composed in its entirety about 273-272 BCE by Jewish scholars at Alexandria that later traditions credited with a Septuagint translation of the Pentateuch into Greek. The primary evidence is literary dependence of Genesis 1-11 through on Barosis' Babylonica. Am I saying that correct? Close enough. Close enough. Babylonica, 278 BCE, which is a, there's a pretty much what he says is there's a priest, a Babylonian priest who can understand the cuneiform tablets. He understands the ancient language and he's translating it for Greeks or people who speak Greek. It's a Hellenized world. OK, literary dependence of the Exodus story on Manitho's Egyptica. Sure. <laughs> 
circa 285, 280 BCE. And datable geological, geopolitical, sorry, references in the table of nations. A number of indications point to a provenance of Alexandria and Egypt, or at least some portions of the Pentateuch, that the Pentateuch utilizing literary sources found at the Great Library of Alexandria was composed at almost the same time as the Alexandrian Septuagint translation provides compelling evidence for some level of communication and collaboration between the authors of the Pentateuch and the Septu Septuagint scholars at Alexandria's museum. The late date of the Pentateuch, as demonstrated by literary dependence on Barossus and Manetho, has two important consequences. The definitive overthrow of the chronological framework of the documentary hypothesis, which is like the standard consensus all scholars to some degree agree with this theory and a third century BCE or later date for other portions of the Hebrew Bible that show literary dependence on the Pentateuch. Can you break that down just so our audience knows what you're trying to do? Okay. We know historically that the Bible was written in Hebrew, and at some point it was translated into Greek. Around 270 BC at Alexandria, which was the center of learning for the whole world at that time, at the museum, great library, scholars from everywhere. Um, and they wanted a copy of these Hebrew traditions and their laws in Greek. So we know that event took place. Hebrew Bible, otherwise known as the Old Testament, had to have been written before that. Now, how long before? That's the question. Was it hundreds and hundreds of years before, like uh, has been proposed in scholarship since the dawn of time uh, and clear to the end of the 20th century? Or was it five minutes before? I mean, we, we don't know, we can't deduce from the fact that it was translated into Greek, how much older the original was. So my research uh, over the years, over the sources that the five books of Moses used, uh, when it was written, who wrote it, where, and what was in their minds when they were coming up with this stuff. Um, so I try and use very rigorous methodology to determine uh, the date and circumstances in which uh, those important five books of Moses were written. I'm over here muted myself. Uh, I'm, I'm a mute. Uh, that was well said. That was well said. And I think everyone's getting the idea. How, how far apart was the Hebrew Bible written? And then you have a translation of it. And most of the scholars that I've looked at say hundreds of years of development from different sources, various sources. And you mentioned this in your book. So I want to read a footnote that I think was vital right off the bat. And you did a good job of putting this right there. You said methodology, because I think it comes down to this. There is a sharp methodological distinction between classical source criticism and traditional biblical source criticism. The latter, the biblical source, uses a variety of techniques to isolate hypothetical sources within biblical text. The identification of sources J, E, D, and P, pre preliminary to the dating arguments of the documentary hypothesis is a prime example of biblical source criticism. Such source documents must remain perpetually hypothetical since they no longer exist as in independent entities. Simply put, we don't have those sources. We don't have original J, original E, D, or P, or any concrete empirical evidence saying, here is the source. We know this. There are hypotheticals, kind of like there's a Q document they say of the gospel. So um, this type of source criticism is rarely encountered in classical scholarship. One notable example being the detection of a catalog of ships as a hypothetical source in Homer's Iliad. Rather, most classical source criticism takes place in later periods that are well populated with text so that a given text antecedents and successors are typically identifiable, that such source criticism has not often been applied to the Hebrew Bible, except in internally, where one biblical text is identified as dependent on another. It, pr it's primary, uh, it primarily 
it's primarily due to assumptions of antiquity of the biblical text, which has precluded the consideration of literary borrowing from Hellenistic sources. An interesting example of classical source criti uh, critical techniques fruitfully applies to cuneiform text is J. Tigays, I think I'm saying this correct, the evolution of the Gilgamesh epic. I hope I'm saying that right. The Sumerian literary antecedents of the Gilgamesh epic are well known, as are several Akkadian versions, allowing an objective analysis of the development of the text from earlier sources. S -s -s Filter that down into dum dum terms for most of us out here. <laughs> okay. Well, through down through the centuries, clear down to the start of the 20th century. Uh, Biblical studies have been in a bubble. Um, they've been a bubble where they only read the Bible and they try and deduce things just from the biblical text. So around 1600, 1700, 1800, the um, scholars began to notice that there are different sources or different voices, mostly in Genesis. One of them was J. Uh, this storytelling source, they used the word Yahweh rather frequently. Um, another one was E, the Elohist, that used the name Elohim. Another one was the priestly source. And then another one was the Deuteronomist, who was primarily in the book of Deuteronomy. They used all this internal evidence to isolate different sources within the Bible. And they did this in a bubble where they didn't have to consider anything outside of their little Bible that they were reading every day. Uh, 20th century, you began to have cuneiform sources. You had the Dead Sea Scrolls. You have uh, the uh, Elephantine papyri. Outside objective information that might be relevant to um, when the Bible was written. Um, objective, external, verifiable, datable, uh, and not just speculative, um, where they theorized that, well, just shortly after the time of Solomon is when uh, J and E were written, and then the Deuteronomist appeared in the time of Josiah, and then Ezra was the time of the priestly sword. And they created this whole imaginative uh, history of how the book of Genesis and the first five books of the Bible were written. Well, now, though, we have these external sources where we can say, no, let's not talk about J as a source or P as a source. Let's talk about, about Barosis as a source uh, or Homer or these authors that we can absolutely find the dates for. That provides some controls as to when um, the Bible is really written. Um, and it's a whole different approach to methodology than uh, traditionally where uh, dating the Bible was just used using biblical literature itself. Now we're more of a scientific, objective, uh, comparative field that brings in as much information from archeology, span inscriptions, Greek sources, everything and bring it all to bear on the problem of uh, when the books of Moses were written. We've got a Mike Pants problem going on over there. I had a fly and I'm not going to let yeah. what happened to uh, yeah. to v Vice President uh, have a fly sit on my... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just I'm playing. Um, no, this is this is interesting because to break that down even simpler is they trust what the text says a little too much sometimes, and they think the text itself is reliable. Um, where you point out in your book some scholars who aren't even in agreement with you, who agree though that look, guys, um. We got a problem. How do you know Ezra is not a literary device rather than a, a historical one or a legend rather than a historical one? And to be fair to these authors where people go, oh, it's a lie. It's a lie. And it's just this. Well, look, th there are pious lies. There are um, there are, like if I was going into battle, I would probably tell my soldiers if I knew we were going to lose, but we really needed to do this. 
that we may win um, whatever is necessary to kind of bolster up a white lie, if you will. And so we, we all do this. But anyway, I want to say that they trust the text sometimes maybe too much, and we don't have outside sources to pin down and say, hey, look, it definitely was written around Ezra's time. And one of the things they'll do is they'll try to look at linguistics and they look inside and they do stuff like that, like you talk about in your book, but you're going to get into a different methodology and we're going to get into that. So the end of your first chapter, you say, the organization of this book follows a program suggested by the above methodology. The crucial step in dating the Pentateuch is establishing a true terminus ad quern. And I was like, what is that? Chapter two shows that the early date of Pentateuchal sources, according to the Deuteronomy hypothesis or documentary hypothesis, sorry, is entirely lacking in external corroboration. Since archaeological evidence, including an analysis of written finds in Judea and at Elephantine, if you don't know what that is, you're going to want to freaking seriously stick around for this, okay? Does not support the existence of any written Pentateuchal materials prior to the third century BCE. So my question for anyone to go further, what you say this a lot in your books. When they go to read your book, they need to know what is terminus ad quem and terminus ad quo. What does that mean? Um, the terminus ad quem. <laughs> well, unless it's the other way around. Um, sometimes my mind flips on these Latin terms okay. like everybody else. <laughs> it's it's the it's the earliest possible date a text was written and the latest possible date. So to date a text, you wanna squeeze that down as closely as possible. Um, the latest possible date, we've already established one thing, it's the translation of the Hebrew Bible into Greek. Uh, it had to have been written before then. So that provides a good terminus ad quem of 270 BC, must have been written prior to that. Um, the other side is how much earlier was it written? Was it written in 900 BC or four, finished in 450 BC? Or was it written in 271 BC? Uh, you know, it, it could be anything in that range. And you want to find out uh, if the Bible uses objectively datable sources so that those narrow down the possible date range. Um, for instance, if the Bible refers to uh, or uses the writings of Homer, that means it had to have been written after 700 BC. Or if it uses Plato, it has to be, have been written after 350 BC. Um, Manetho, 280 BC, Barosis the same. And, and you narrow it down until, in my book, I trimmed it down to somewhere between 273 BC is the oldest and 272 BC is the latest. So that's pretty darn uh, accurate. And uh, that's that's what my method is uh, aimed at, at doing. I, I This is, that's an extremely controversial position to take, I suspect, in light of all of the consensus scholarship that's out there. Uh, <laughs> have you got a lot of backlash on this? Uh, I mean, I know you've gotten some positive feedback from Thomas L. Thompson and some other scholars, I'm certain, um, but I'm sure others are not following. Well, um, American scholarship especially has been slow to uh, uh, agree to the possibility that uh, the Hebrew Bible was written as late as the Hellenistic era. But it's starting to become more mainstream. There are more and more scholars, including some in America, who are willing to contemplate the idea that um, parts of the books of Moses were written in the Hellenistic era, which means after the conquest of Alexander the Great, when Greek influences arrived in uh, Judea and the East. Uh, but through the end of the 20th century, it was very controversial. Uh, authors like William Deaver, he said that uh, anyone who would even contemplate that the Bible could be written that late uh, was a nihilist and an anarchist in trying to bring down the downfall of Western civilization. What? He, he literally said that in one of his books um, in the controversy between uh, 
maximalism, which means let's have the Bible as old as we can possibly date it, versus minimalism, which said, let's consider maybe it was written later and let's look at the other end of that date range. Maybe it was written, wow, even as late as the time of the Greeks, which was radical at the time, but uh, is becoming less controversial. I have to say for our audience, the reason why you really need to not only pick up this book, but get the Philo and the creation of the Hebrew Bible is because <clears throat> in this book so far, I have not completed everything. I'm taking my time really noting on this. And this is important to wrap our heads around because this, if you understand this book and you read what he says, it'll get you right into the conflict that goes on in scholarship right now. And you can really start to wrap your head around some of the interesting ideas that are going on because I'm just newly introduced to this. And um, you are my introduction into a field that I'm not used to exploring. And I really appreciate that. But in your Philo book, you, you, Plato. Oh, sorry, Plato. <laughs> I'm sorry. In, in your Plato book, you actually take the time in the first chapter to express scholars for a long time have seen Greek connection. They have seen a Greek Hellenistic connection, but it wasn't necessarily, they, they, they weren't sure, did this happen before the eighth or ninth century BC? It's some ancient antiquity time. They bumped into each other. We just don't have any empirical evidence. We have no evidence. We have no one writing saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was this guy I bumped into from Greece. Nothing. We have nothing. Um, or is it more likely we have to push it forward after these conquests, after these exiles, and now they're touching place in Alexandria and whatnot. And you do a fine job showing literary connections between laws and things from Athenian, all that. So I just want to say that up front, this is an interesting theory. And you take your time, you say authorship of key portions of the Pentateuch by Jewish scholars, knowledgeable in Greek and having access to Alexandria's library in 273, 272 BCE points to the identity of the authors of the Pentateuch with a team of 70 or 72 Jewish scholars whom tradition credited with having created the Septuagint translation about this time through the generous pa patronage of Ptolemy II Phil Philadelphus. The objective of the Septuagint scholars' literary activities is best understood as the composition of the Hebrew Pentateuch itself and only secondarily its translation into Greek. The diverse Pentateuchal sources, J, E, D, and P, and H, are best interpreted as illustrating the different social strata and interest among the scholars that work on the project. What are you trying to say there? It, it, compared to what the scholars are saying, they say over long periods of time, these sources developed and collect and then someone put them together. You're saying these are just different, if you will, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, different guys from different, uh, I guess you almost like today we have denominations, if you will, uh -huh. yeah. uh, different backgrounds come together when they go to compile this and create this. Yeah, the um, I think that the documentary hypothesis um, and in the 20th century became the supplementary hypothesis. And uh, you know, there's different, so many variations. I, but I think they did a pretty good job in identifying different voices or different authors uh, who were at work in Genesis and Exodus and so on and so forth. What they did a disastrous job of is establishing the dates of those sources. And uh, they start out with the assumption that uh, every one of them was in a different century. They were all in their own different times. Uh, first you had J and then E came along. He was, uh, J was in Judah and E was from Israel and Israel, they made their additions and then Josiah came along and the Deuteronomist, they added their part. Then the priests added a bunch of stuff centuries later. So you have four different editions. Um, there's not the slightest evidence that, there, that there's this sequence, uh, century by century, of uh, successive authors. In fact, um, it's been debated uh, ever since the start of the documentary hypothesis, is J older than E or is E older than J? Uh, the arguments point both ways. Is uh, the Deuteronomist older than Genesis or younger? Uh, uh, yeah, the relative order has never been agreed upon. Um, 
And I think the reason is because, yeah, um, sometimes J uses E, sometimes E uses J. They were both in the same room. They were contemporary. They were different denominations, as you say, or groups that were all cooperating. So Moses, the Torah of Pentateuch. And there's a tradition that says there were 70 scholars at Alexandria uh, to take the Hebrew Bible and turn it into a Greek edition. Well, Septuagint scholars only see maybe three translators. They can recognize three different translators at work, not 70. So what are all these 70 scholars doing? <laughs> uh, those are the authors. Um, and there wasn't seven, it was less than that. But um, you had bunches of authors representing different perspectives and they all collaborated and they got in the same room and, and wrote the Moses and uh, the Pentateuch as a result. So J, E, D, P, and H, yes, they're distinct sources, but they're all contemporary. They're like different football teams that are in, uh, they're all in the NFL in the same season. Um, they're not uh, separated by decades or centuries. And I want to say, uh, as a footnote to that, what you just stated, for anyone who's skeptical of what you present, you're not closed off to them being possibly, uh, you are sticking to what you can know, though, based off evidence that is either inductive or deductive and not historiographical, historiographical, because you're saying, look, uh, I've got some evidence that it's silent and it speaks wonders. And so one of those is the elephantine papyri, but we're going to get into that in just a second. I want to get your comment on Jay Wellhausen and the documentary hypothesis. Can you comment on the evolution of what you think? Because most people say, look, um, the God of the Bible was polytheistic or there were they had many gods. The religion of Israel was many gods. And then, you know, it takes this evolution to monotheism and you could see this supposed development that's taking place in the different Pentateuchal, uh, Pentateuchal sources. Also, he relied heavily on the text rather than archaeology. Do you want to make a comment on that before we get into Elephantine and going from there? Sure. Uh, Julius Wellhausen, who wrote at the end of the 19th century, um, he relied on uh, a bunch of earlier um, biblical critics. Uh, Baruch Spinoza was the first, and then there was uh, Raff and uh, I could list off, you know, 15 different people who each had their contributions. Someone said E is different from J, and someone said, well, there's the priest. And anyway, he tied it all together because he came up with a convincing story. Uh, he said that the Deuteronomist um, wrote in the time of Josiah because uh, the book of Second Kings chapter 23 said that... Uh, Josiah discovered a copy of the laws of Moses in the temple. Um, well, that was said to be Deuteronomy. Uh, and so that that dates Deuteronomy to the year 613 BC. If you believe that story in 2 Kings, which, where's the evidence for that? And, uh, and he went on and Ezra, they brought the priestly laws from Babylonia and brought them back to Judea because in the book of Ezra, he read from the law and some of what he read sounds priestly. So he was able to say 453 BC, uh, Ezra, he integrated the priestly laws into the Pentateuch and he had, all, he had it all tied into this biblical history, uh, which um, is highly questionable. I mean, you can't prove uh, those events in biblical history or rather historiography. Um, can't be verified by archeology. span um, And the, min the minimalist school or the Copenhagen School of Biblical Criticism, Thomas Thomason, Niels Peter Lemke, Barbini, Philip Davies and others, they began to question whether this biblical history that 
they used to hang the dates of the sources on, whether that biblical history was uh, actual history or is it just story? Is it myth? Is it made up? How do we know that they are true? How do we know what date those are written? Um, they seem to be very late and uh, they, they're more theology and mythology uh, than actual contemporary history. So Wellhausen, he was in that bubble where you just use the Bible to learn about the Bible. You don't bring in Greek sources or other sources. Uh, and it was a brilliant construct, but his method uh, was highly questionable. And he he's now, everyone agrees that he put too much reliance on the biblical uh, history writing or historiography. Uh, and that's just an unsound uh, method. Yeah, you say uh, the documentary hypothesis, as developed by Wellhausen, illustrates the grave danger of circular reasoning, Bible using the Bible, inherent in dating texts by means of a historical construct created to facilitate the dating of these same texts. Under the methodology advocated in this book, the dating of text is properly an enterprise prior to and entirely separate from the writing of history. So um, you, you list off these scholars. Maybe you can comment a couple, uh, on what some of these scholars say. I figure we would take the time to like really point out. These are some, uh, ladies and gentlemen, these are some big names. These are some really well-known scholars, and they play a vital role in uh, how people are analyzing this stuff. And, and one of them, you said, Van Cedars. How did Van Cedars play a role in dating of the Pentateuch? If you can remember some of these guys, like I know you, you sure. have them on your book, so I'm, I'm stretching your memory. <laughs> yeah. Well, John Van Cedars, um, he and Thomas Thompson, they both wrote in, I think, the same year. They both wrote books that questioned whether uh, the traditions about Abraham uh, were historical uh, or the, all the patriarchs. So between the two of them, they, they shot down treating the patriarchs as history. But more importantly, in Van Cedar's book, In Search of History, he brought out lots of Greek connections to, um, to the biblical his history writing. Um, for instance, the Greeks famously, they, uh, they had a genealogical structure to history. Uh, different peoples and tribes, they were traced back to one ancestor. Uh, like Hellas was the ancestor of the Hellenes or Greeks, uh, or um, uh, Perseus was the ancestor of the Persians. So they they had these heroes back in mythological times uh, that they traced their ancestry to, and um, were also they also built their history around. And um, the book of Genesis does something very similar, not only with the table of nations that catalogs 70 different nations descended from 70 famous people, Ham, uh, Shem, Ham, Japheth, so on and so forth, Canaan. Um, but you also have Abraham as a famous ancestor and Isaac and Israel was an eponymous uh, leader. An eponym means uh, your tribe is named after that person. Uh, the, the word name is in the word eponym. Uh, so you have 12 tribes of Israel that are named after uh, the 12 sons of Israel, uh, Jacob and Simeon and Gad and Reuben. So all of that is very, very Greek. Um, and he w went into all sorts of other things too. So he really broke a lot of ground in understanding um, biblical history writing as a very Greek enterprise. Uh, but he also thought that uh, the, the biblical writers kind of independently discovered uh, historiography before the Greeks did. Uh, and Hal, Baruch Halpern and others have remarked on the genius how all these all these biblical writings, they anticipate Greek developments by centuries. 
Well, maybe that's true, or maybe the biblical writings were a lot later and did borrow from the Greeks and not vice versa. So Jan John Van Suters, he is very important establishing Greek connections, but he also dates things pretty early, and uh, he's not very useful in that respect. Yeah, you point out one of the flaws you say is uh, he's correct in pointing out these connections, but he has no extra biblical foundation to suppose where the connections found their way to meeting each other. And it's like the same right. problem you had in chapter one of your Plato and the creation of the Hebrew Bible, where you're like, look, they think it happened way back where nobody can prove anything and there's no evidence of it, but it happened. Or later where we know for certain Hellenism and the the Levant and everything, all these people were intermingling. They were definitely sharing and comparing. And uh, so you do a good job of that. That's really interesting. Um, I know. There's uh, something that I wanted to say to illustrate that. There was uh, back in ancient times, um, people knew about the writings of Moses. They knew about the writings of Plato, and they knew they were related. A lot of the laws in Plato are very similar to the laws of Moses. But everyone believed that books of Moses were written like um, a thousand years earlier. So therefore, Plato must have borrowed from Moses. Like he read uh, somehow this Hebrew Bible made it to Athens, and he secretly read it and didn't tell anybody about it and came up with all these laws. You know, the alternate uh, theory is that uh, the laws of Moses came from Plato in the, in the Hellenistic area, era when uh, they had writings, uh, the writings of Plato were all very well known and accessible to everyone. So did, did Plato copy Moses or did Moses copy Plato? That's kind of the controversy. Uh, that keeps on playing over and over again with different authors. I think a timeline is important in this to let people who aren't acquainted, like they know names, they're dumb like me, okay? Don't feel bad. Trust me, I'm ignorant. I just don't know. Um, Plato is said to have existed in anywhere from 428 to 347 BCE, from what I understand. Uh, so he is prior to when you say that the translation, and not only you, everyone agrees that the translation took place around the time that you say that both of these uh, versions, the Hebrew as well as the Greek, take place. And so if you can find clear things that only show up in Plato and nowhere else, yeah. you really have to say one borrowed from the other or vice versa. And somehow there's a genealogical connection here. And so... Uh, arguing that while well, Moses he had Moses's writings, all we need for you to be wrong, Russell, is some type of extra biblical source writing that we know comes from around the time prior to what you said. And guys, you got Russell off the hook. Russell, you could just say, ah, it was a cool theory, but yeah. I'm going to update I'll, and write a new book and yeah. say, here it I'll is. Give it you up. Know? I'll give it up. Exactly. <laughs> this is great. So um, Plato comes before. This uh, Barosis and Manitho situation, which you're going to want to stay tuned, we're probably not going to get into that detail yet till the next episode. But um, what about Scholar? And I could probably be mistaken these these first names. And please um, don't take disrespect that I may not say doctor or something. I, I'm only going out of your book. And so you have – what about G. Garbini? The, and the Philistines, he has an interesting theory. He tries to reconcile what you're talking about here. And he goes, look, we don't have Greeks, but see, the Philistines were the Greek type people that they got this information from. Can you comment on this? Yeah, uh, Garbini, he, he decided, OK, there's a lot of similarities between the Greeks and uh, the Jewish writings. Um, so there's been all sorts of theories as to how those two groups talk. Now, in the Hellenistic era, is no problem because the Greeks conquered Judea and, uh, you know, you could uh, consult your local soldier, uh, no problem. Um, but before then, way over in Athens, how did that communicate to Judea? Well, Carbini said uh, the Philistine, I think, the Philistines. Um, 
which was one little tribe on the coast of, uh, uh, of the Eastern Mediterranean. Other people said the Phoenicians. Uh, other people said, well, uh, the people of Cyprus, they traded between the Greeks and, uh, and the Levantine coast. Uh, and there's all, sort, all sorts of models, all sorts of theories. But these, these traders who, uh, who would carry Greek uh, pots and uh, olive oil and this and that and, and trade them on the coast, um, they weren't also discussing philosophical uh, theory and, and uh, discussing laws. And uh, we're going to tell our, uh, our local guy who has the, the donkey caravan that takes our pots to Judea and tell him about all the latest developments uh, in Plato and uh, Homer. And uh, that's not how it happened back then. Um, Knowledge was shared between educated elites, the ruling classes. They shared that sort of information. Um, and that's something that uh, Garbini didn't recognize and a lot of other people didn't recognize, recognize. They just speculated. There were people in contact with both groups. So there's this process of cultural osmosis where information and traditions just kind of seeped from the Greeks over to the Jews or vice versa. And uh, that's not the way knowledge was communicated back in the ancient world. But he did recognize that uh, there were Greek influences and it could have taken place even as late as the Septuagint. And uh, he was innovative in that way. He's a good Italian scholar. Well, you character. Yeah, you definitely compliment, even though you show what you disagree with, you compliment these guys in your book. Um, what about P.R. Davies and his dating of the Pentateuch? Um, he was also part of that. Uh, he, he, he belonged to, he, he went to Sheffield, England, and yet he became known as part of the Copenhagen School of Biblical Criticism. Um, it was basically uh, Niels Peter Lemke, Thomas Thompson, Philip Davies, and then Garbini and, and, and a couple others were in there too. Um, so Philip Davies, he, um, his book In Search of Ancient Israel, uh, it was very influential in saying that when you talk about Israel, uh, there's more than one Israel. There's the historical Israel, and we see that in inscriptions. Um, um, you know, it shows up in inscriptions. So we know that there was a real entity named Israel. And there's the biblical Israel, which is a literary creation. So you really have to distinguish this literary construct, which existed in the realm of story, from history. You can't confuse history and biblical writing because uh, biblical writings are they're different from inscriptions. Inscriptions are carved in stone at that time. You know they're contemporary, so they're, they're reliable and datable. Uh, but until you can date the biblical writings, which Davies acknowledged could be as late as, I think, the late Persian era, maybe the Hellenistic era, until you can date those, um, you can't say that they're contemporary. You can't, they're, they're less than fact. They are a written text of indeterminate date and indeterminate uh, factual content. And he was very uh, influential in questioning uh, biblical historiography uh, as something different from history, which it was previously uh, viewed as. You read the Bible, you're reading history. That seems a big methodology early on. Uh, what about N.P. Lemch? I think I'm saying this correct. His dating. Yeah. Nels, Nels Peter Lemke. Lemke. Um, he wrote a very influential article called, uh, I think it was, uh, The Old Testament, a Hellenistic book, question mark, in 
happened earlier, uh, a year earlier in Dane. Dane you, you, you broke up. You broke up. Go back uh, his title and work from there. Okay. Mills Peter Lemke. Um, in 1993, wrote a, an influential article called um, The Old Testament, a Hellenistic book. And he, he pointed out that instead of assuming that the Old Testament was written. Your, mic, your mic's really close to your mouth. I can hear the. Uh, okay. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, so in, instead of assuming that the Old Testament was as old as it claimed to be, that the books of Moses were written by Moses, it's, Isaiah wrote the book of Isaiah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's really bad. I didn't want anyone to be like, what the? Okay, there, try that now. I'm sorry. All right. I'll, I'm trying that. Yes, yes, my, yes. Yeah. I apologize. Um, he said, what's the actual evidence? Uh, what's the first evidence we have that, of when these things were dated. They said, well, really, um, you've got the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are like uh, second, first century BC. We know that these biblical writings were written then because we have fragments of them. We actually found them. And really, we can uh, reasonably suppose that the books of Moses were written by 270 BC because we have the Septuagint translation. Um, so those provide the latest possible date that we absolutely do know that they were written in the Hellenistic era. We don't have any contemporary evidence to prove that they were older than that. Not as old as the kings of Judah, not the Babylonian period, the Persian era. There's no proof that they were that old. And he said that in terms of methodology, let's start with what we know. We know that it was written um, by, say, the third century BC. We don't really know that it was written earlier than that. So let's make the latest date uh, the starting point for the discussion. Um, and that viewpoint was became known as minimalism. And uh, the opposite view that let's date them as early as we can get away with uh, <clears throat> this. Unless there's anachronisms, uh, we'll trust uh, that uh, Isaiah was written by Isaiah or whatever. Um, so the Maximalists were very upset that he did not share their cherished long-held assumptions and that he had an entirely different starting point uh, that was rooted in objective external evidence. Uh, and that was really a revolution. Uh, it, it, uh, it started off my research and that of many others. Let me ask you this uh, while we're still on him. Where did he land? I know he started with minimalism. Did he go, did he backtrack prior to your dating and say, well, I'm sorry, I got to go further back. I think it does. I think the Hebrew Bible goes back to this state. Where did he land? Well, he, um, he is willing to uh, acknowledge that there might be older materials that are embedded within the Hebrew Bible. So am I. You know, I, I love it if I can find a part of the Hebrew Bible that is earlier than the Hellenistic era. That's exciting to me. Um, like the book of Haggai, which talks about how we're going, uh, a prophetic oracle that to, to authorize the rebuilding of the Jewish temple. It looks authentic. So there's a book that I believe was written around uh, 615 BC. That's exciting to me. So he, he agreed that there could be older sources, but um, he thought that the Pentateuch was put together in the Hellenistic era. He thought in probably in Babylonia, uh, because of the book of Genesis and those, all those Babylonian traditions, how their ancestors came from Babylon, from Ur of the Chaldees and migrated <clears throat> to the Promised Land. Um, 
more recently, he's become convinced by some of my arguments hmm. that uh, that the Bible was probably uh, the books of Moses were probably written in Alexandria. Uh, he's particularly persuaded by the fact that there's a lot of constitutional material in the books of Moses that could only have been written in the Hellenistic era and uh, could only have been acquired by people reading books about Greek constitutions, which were found at uh, Alexandria's Great Library. So he's come around. It's very gratifying that one of the giants of the field is um, at least partially endorsing some of my theories. See, this is this is where it gets really good. I like this because when I read your book or heard your theory, the first thing I thought is he thinks everything was written in 273, 272 BCE, which means which means in my little fundamentalist black or white either or mind, right? I'm all I think is he either believes it's all written in or it's not. You are not suggesting that all the material used within this it must be dated to 272, 273. They're relying on source material that may go who knows how far back. Like, for example, I have huh? a very good scholar friend who is a documentary hypothesis guy, uh, Dr. Joshua Boehm. And, uh, you know, he could read a lot of these ancient languages, Sumerian, Akkadian, et cetera, et cetera. And um, the, he and Dr. John J. Collins, for example, look at Daniel in chapters one through six and see a older or at least some of it huh? in this passage, huh? an older Aramaic source. And it's like, this sounds like this might be older, but could they not have gotten this in the Alexandrian library? Is there not Aramaic sources? Are there not like you do with Manetho, like you do with Barosis? Could there not be older sources they're, they're going into or maybe borrowing from? I, I don't know. And that's the question I'd like to ask you maybe before we jump into uh, Thomas L. Thompson, but. Uh... <laughs> sure. Well, uh, sure. There's, um, there's, Lots of sources from the Alexandria Library. Um, there's also Egyptian uh, source in the Book of Proverbs and another one uh, in the Psalms. And uh, But there's also some local native sources. There's the King List of Judah and the King List of Israel in the Book of Second Kings. And you can verify the later names in those lists. Uh, those names show up in Assyrian and Babylonian inscriptions in the proper time frame. So those are authentic and they were preserved locally uh, from Iron Age, Samaria and Judah uh, down to the time when the Book of Kings was written in the Hellenistic era. Uh, so that's very exciting to know that there's some authentic older materials there. I got, I got a poke for those like me. This is great. <clears throat> You're not saying what's being said in first Kings is really authentic historical documentation or older material about Israel's real history here. The list of Kings comes from other people groups. I mean, oftentimes, like you've pointed out, Solomon was not an actual guy who actually existed that was ruling Israel. Uh, you know, he is another character, another king from another nation who was of great uh, magnitude with great power. So this king's list you just described that has older material that we can prove is borrowing from another people's. It's not about actual Israelites and their king's list. Like they were the ones who were these kings. They're really borrowing this in a sense. Well, um, no, the kings of Israel were from the nation of Israel. Okay. Um, the name Israel appears in, uh, in an inscription of Shalmaneser III in 853 BC. He refers to King Ahab of the kingdom of Israel taking part of central Syria. So the name Israel actually shows up there as the name of that kingdom. And that was one of the in the Book of Kings at the right time. Um, mostly the Assyrians refer to it as uh, Samaria or uh, Bit Humri. They use uh, different names for that country. But yeah, there was a kingdom called Israel. It wasn't 12 tribes. 
uh, it's nothing like uh, in the older books of uh, Genesis and Exodus and so on and so forth. But there was a nation called Israel. And then to the south, there was another nation called Judah. So both kingdoms fell, but both of them had preserved king lists that listed their kings and how long they ruled. And those documents were evidently preserved down through time um, and they're local, uh, authentic, ancient documents. Uh, interesting. That's interesting. So what, when, when, do these, when does the king list historically with the actual evidence we have here, how far back does that go before it cuts off? Do you have a date on that? Yeah, um, with the Northern Kingdom uh, of Israel or Samaria, um, the first king that we have uh, confirmed in inscriptions would be King Omri and then his son, King Ahab. So that's like about um, 890 BC. Uh, before then, the kings between Solomon and Omri, uh, which are different dynasties, uh, who knows where those names came from? They don't appear in inscriptions. But uh, there's an inscription from Moab, and there's an uh, Assyrian inscriptions that mention those two kings. Now, in Judah, confirmation starts much later um, in the 730s BC with, uh, um, I think, uh, it's Jehoahaz and then Hezekiah. And after that, yes, those kings appear in, in inscriptions and historical sources. The earlier kings of Judah, we don't know who they are. We don't know if they were a local governor uh, or a, a clan leader, or they weren't. They weren't kings. There was no kingdom. There was no Judah mentioned in inscriptions in earlier times. So the earliest part of those lists are legendary, but the later parts uh, can be verified. Interesting. Which is terrific. Yeah, that is. That is good. So if we could find anything concrete, that's always good. Um, scholar Thomas L. Thompson, he is something else. And I know that he loved your book and said, look, I, I, I got to get this published. We got to get this guy. Uh, we got to make sure this thing gets out there. So tell me a little bit about his dating, what he thinks and um, or thought, and maybe a little development of what he thinks now. Uh, and teach us a little bit about that. Yeah, Thomas Thomason, uh, he was a bit of a maverick. Uh, he and John Cedars, they both published books that said that uh, these stories about Abraham are basically mythical. So he was ostracized for many years after that. Um, his PhD was, uh, uh, thesis was rejected by uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, who later became Pope. Uh, so, uh, yeah, he, he worked as a house painter for 10 years in the U.S. He couldn't get a job as a teacher because um, his ideas were too controversial. Well, Niels Peter Lemke of the University of Copenhagen uh, said, you can teach here. Move over to Denmark, where civilized, we're progressive. Uh, and we'll give you the freedom to pursue your research. Uh, so he <clears throat> he has been especially uh, a, an important voice in minimalism, suggesting that the historiographic writings, you know, what we call history, from Genesis through Kings and Ezra and Nehemiah, they're uh, largely myth. That is to say, story. They're stories, and they have theological content, and they can't be relied on as factual history. And he thought they could have been written uh, probably in the later Persian era, um, but possibly as late as the early Hellenistic era. So he and Davies, they both, they were creeping later and later. They hadn't quite arrived to where Niels Peter Lemke and I had arrived at. Uh, but we're all very uh, friendly. And yeah, uh, a friend of mine, Greg Doudna, was going to the University of Copenhagen. 
And just on a lark, uh, for my own benefit, <laughs> I wrote this book, Porosis and Genesis. And I said, Greg, why don't you read this? And because uh, I like doing research. He read it. He says, I have to show this to Thomas Thompson. He showed it to Thompson, and Thompson said, we have to publish this. So Thompson has been, uh, <clears throat> I guess you'd practically call him my patron. Uh, he has pretty much anything I want to write. Uh, the people at Copenhagen will, uh, will publish, starting with uh, Morosis and Genesis. And he's a great friend. I met him in Copenhagen at a conference, and a terrific guy. Wow. Yeah, this sounds great. I'm glad that a place like that is willing to entertain and uh, consider new evidence that might uh, place the dating different. Yeah, he um, he sounds like someone I really need to get acquainted with. Let's go to R. Alberts, and I'm not sure his first name. Um, Rainier. Rainier Alberts. Ramir Alberts. <clears throat> okay, if you don't mind touching yeah. on him. Well, he was... Uh... He was an important um, 20th century author. He wrote a book called The History of Israelite Religion. And uh, he came up with this story of when the sources were created. He, he thought that the uh, Pentateuch was kind of a compromise between priests and uh, elders. Um, I agree with, but in a much later time. Um, but he was basically interested in uh, extracting sociological information about the groups behind uh, the books of Moses and analyzing who they were and how they could have interacted with each other and, and tie it in with uh, his reading of biblical history. And so he was... Uh, he was another one of those who used uh, historiography, biblical historiography, to date um, the books of the Bible. Um, he has kind of declined as, as a voice in the 21st century. Um, he had a long distinguished career. He still publishes articles, but he's not that influential. Okay. Okay. Interesting. And then last but not least, we have to talk about William G. Deaver. And um, I, he has been great in my deconversion situation with finding out that Yahweh was married to Asherah. And, you know, like I was like, whoa, he has a wife. So he had an interesting uh, episode. He did a hour presentation just showing that. So I, I really was fond of his work. I said, wow. Uh, but in your book, um, you kind of point out some pros and cons in terms of criticism, if you will. He talks about something called classical Hebrew and late biblical Hebrew. Can you elaborate on that? And his dating, he goes as far. He goes, he's almost like a maximalist in some some ways, at least with some sources. But can you can you give us a little bit on this gentleman? Yeah, he started out very maximalist. Uh, he demonized the minimalists. He made launch personal attacks on Thomas Thompson and Lemke and the rest and said that, uh, you know, they were going to bring down the, the downfall of, uh, of everything we hold dear to in uh, Western civilization, especially biblical scholarship. But at the same time, <clears throat> he presented himself as a uh, as an archaeologist's archaeologist, you know, like uh, top of the profession, and uh, and but in in action, and and he has published a lot of interesting stuff, uh, like like you mentioned. Uh, but he also is informed by conservative scholarship's uh, reading of the Bible a lot. He accepts. Um, uncritically, a lot of contemporary theories about um, the antiquity of the Bible and the books of kings. And, uh, uh, but he is a larger than life personality. And I, I quote him for some of his material, which is uh, uh, factually based and uh, archaeologically informed. Uh, 
but he he he's unhinged in on certain topics. At least he used to be, but now he basically has adopted uh, the tenets <clears throat> the tenets of minimalism that uh, you know, um, like Thompson, you should use archaeology um, to construct history and not rely primarily on the biblical test text. So uh, formally, he has come around to. Uh, the min minimalist position, uh, but uh, he still kind of uh, hasn't buried the hatchet, as far as I can tell. Yeah, I remember watching him discuss uh, a lot of high places that they have archaeological finds that weren't destroyed. And so yeah. here you're supposed to destroy them, and well, they're not destroyed. So it's it's really interesting. And you could tell that they are done by Israelites. It's not like this is just some random uh, temple site or a sacrificial loca locale where they're doing uh, whatever they might do in this particular locale, most likely sacrifice and stuff like that. It's obvious they didn't destroy a lot of these places. So when the Bible says, and then they destroyed all the high places, well, they didn't get all of them. So we had a problem here. And, and, uh, Anyway, I just I thought I'd mention he has some interesting archaeological finds that I thought were critical and I like the critical stuff. So there are yeah, three methods, too. three methods for dating, historiographical, inductive and deductive. And you are pretty much focused on inductive and deductive methodology real quick on the classical Hebrew and late biblical Hebrew that uh, Mr. Deaver does. Do you have a comment on that particular point that he brings out? Well, he doesn't do much of that himself, but he does rely on others, uh, biblical scholars who do. Um, scholars have seen a progression of language developments within the Hebrew Bible. There's one type of language that's called classical biblical Hebrew that is used in consider some of the older uh, biblical you know, Genesis through Kings and uh, some of the prophets. Now, late biblical Hebrew is uh, characteristic of some of the latest biblical texts like Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah. Um, and it's also shared by the book of Sirach, which is uh, uh, a book in the... Uh, between the Old and New Testament, it was written around 180 BC. He used that uh, linguistic variation. So we know it was current around then. Um, classical biblical Hebrew, it shares some features uh, of language that is shared uh, by inscriptions from the uh, iron, iron. It, it does have some old elements. You, you broke up. You broke up. It shares inscriptions? Yeah. Uh, inscriptions uh, found at uh, Arad and Lakish and different archaeological sites um, that have written texts on them, mostly on pot sherds. Uh, they have some features of classical biblical Hebrew. Uh, so... Classical Biblical Hebrew was used in ancient times. Late Biblical Hebrew was used in modern times. I um, mean, like in the Hellenistic and Roman eras. But when was that transition from one to the other? Well, that really all depends on when you date these biblical books. If you date the books of the Torah, uh, in the Hellenistic era, then that means they were still using classical biblical Hebrew uh, in the 200s BC. Um, and so there's a, a bit of circularity, circular reasoning when they say that uh, a book that, uh, that conservative scholarship dates in the 700s BC uses classical biblical Hebrew um, they say that proves that it's it's that old when it could be a lot younger depending on the dating of that book. So it's it's really not useful for dating biblical books. That's the bottom line. And there's no inscriptional evidence 
to prove when the transition from classical biblical Hebrew to late biblical Hebrew took place. You can't uh, verify when that transition took place in inscriptions. Could have happened 400 BC, could have happened 200 BC. They really don't know, and they shouldn't pretend. They shouldn't pretend that they do. That's interesting. Well, uh, you know, P.R. Davies' questions, you say the reform ever took place. Uh, talking about the Book of the Covenant discovered. Could Ezra also be late in legend? This is a question I'm asking our audience to consider. Uh, the historical framework of the documentary hypothesis was based on the untested premise that literary accounts of 2 Kings 22 through 23 and Nehemiah 8 through 10 represented actual and actual uh, accurate historical data. At the time the documentary hypothesis was formulated, scholars neither saw the need to test the historicity of biblical historiographic historiography, historiography, I can't even say it, <laughs> historiography, historiography, there we go, <laughs> I can't even say it, okay, um, nor had the means to do so. Today, archaeological evidence and inscriptional, it's inscriptional and other ancient Textual finds play an increasingly dominant role in reconstructing history and in testing the accuracy of literary sources. Josiah's reform was a literary, not historical in nature. So we're going to transition to two things before we end up exiting this show, because we, we aren't even going to get into Manitho and Barosis yet. I, I cannot wait to do that episode where we can dig into these two guys. Because your chapter, even just going into Manitho, is quite a long one. I read chapter one and two, and I was like, okay. And then I just, you know how you go forward to see, like, how far is this chapter going to go? And I was going and going and going. I said, there's a lot here. So the two silver amulets dating to the late 7th or early 6th century BCE, discovered at Katif Hinnom, uh, Katif Hinnom in Jerusalem by G. Bar K in 1980, they contain a priestly benediction. Three lines of which read, may Yahweh bless and protect you. May Yahweh look favorably upon you and grant you well-being. Translation by your dini. This has close parallels with number 6, 24 through 26. So pretty much the argument here goes, well, look, this parallels numbers. Numbers is in the Bible. It's part of the Torah. And this is dated to the 6th, 7th century B.C., Come on, Russell, what's wrong with you? Can't you see that this is evidence against your hypothesis? <laughs> um, well, even the, the, uh, the person who discovered uh, these amulets uh, a name of, uh, by the name of Gabriel Barquet, who I met in Jerusalem, by the way, as a, he was a tour guide that uh, gave me and some others a tour of Jerusalem when I was there. Uh, presenting on the Dead Sea Scrolls at an international conference. Uh, great guy. Anyway, even he says, this doesn't prove that the Book of Numbers was in existence back then. It proves that that priestly formula was in existence. There are like six markers within the quote itself that point to it as an oral formula, something that was recited, something that was spoken, not something that was written. So you have this, uh, this oral formula um, that who knows how long it existed just verbally before it was written down. It's kind of like um, if someone said, uh, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, that's a very common um, formula, a priestly formula. Um, but because somebody's saying that doesn't mean that uh, it was written down or they got it out of a book. Um, you know, people use those words for centuries upon centuries. So um, that shows the earliest possible date uh, on which that oral tradition could have been founded. It comes from something authentic uh, from the 600s BC, but when that was put uh, put to parchment is a totally different issue. 
Yeah, I think it's hard for us in the 21st century to understand what scholars are trying to talk about with oral tradition. You know, we we are so simply come home, put on our TV, play our video games, read a book, whatever, not realizing to taking for granted what the ancient world did. They didn't have all these writings. It wasn't out there for common folk. Oftentimes everything was oral. And this is where a lot of uh, there are a lot of interesting theories. I have a good friend, Dr. John Knight Lunwall, talks about orality and people who were of oral uh, before writing their, their hardware was the same as ours, but the way their software worked was very different. But anyway, um, we don't really think that because when we go, well, the father, the son, the Holy spirit, I learned that from writings, or I learned that from a church that learned that from writings. Well, yeah, I get that. I understand where they're coming from, or they might've had someone who wrote this, but it's interesting, uh, to note that what you're trying to suggest is they, it wasn't like we have today where there's a bunch of books floating around all the time and we have a lot of stuff in writings. In fact, eventually, who knows, we might end up having everything as media at one point and we're going to go writing. What is that? You know, and yeah. the, the software yeah. might change, you know, and so <laughs> it's interesting. So to think like that, but um, let's, let's get into something that's going to tackle what you just discussed here and really what is the elephantine papyri? Is it an elephant stamped on a piece of paper? I mean, <laughs> what's going on here? Yeah, elephantine. Um, the uh, people of Egypt, they loved their elephants. So, uh, and especially later on, uh, the Ptolemies, uh, they went on all sorts of elephant hunting expeditions. Uh, and, uh, you know, so... That's, that's where the name Elephantine came from. The actual uh, Egyptian name was Yeb, Y-E-B. So anyway, the Elephantine papyri were written at a military colony of Elephantine. Iraq, the Nile River. And it was the border colony between Egypt and Ethiopia, guarding against an Ethiopian invasion. The colonists who were there, they were uh, from they were from Judea, and uh, they were Aramean. So they were actually Jews who were living there in this military colony, and they wrote uh, all sorts of documents uh, between about 450 BC. 400 BC that had been preserved uh, on parchment or leather um, or on uh, ostraca or pot shirts uh, because the Egyptian climate is such that uh, these, these old documents were preserved. Well, these Jews in Elephantine, they had their own temple. They practiced polytheism. They had, uh, they knew about the seventh day of the week, but uh, they worked on the seventh day of the week. There's one papyrus that says, if you don't get those vegetables off that boat on Saturday, the seventh day, I'll kill you. I will kill you if you don't do the work <laughs> that I'm telling you to do on the Sabbath, basically. Um, wow. It had, uh, they observed the Passover, but not, not the biblical Passover. Uh, it was an agricultural festival, but there was no Moses. There was no Exodus in their Passover ritual. Uh, it was just uh, sacrificing a lamb and not having any yeast uh, in their household, which also meant they couldn't drink any beer. Uh, mm. The papyrus says no beer allowed uh, during these seven days. So they were practicing Jews. They were in communication with the Jews in Jerusalem because the Egyptians got mad and burned down their temple. And so they asked the priests in Judea and the leaders of Samaria, uh, can, we, can we have your blessing to, to rebuild this temple? So the people in Jerusalem, evidently thought it was okay that there were multiple temples that, that they could have their own temple there fine no problem um, so there's no evidence of any biblical writings 
There were no laws of Moses. They didn't know Moses. They didn't know Abraham, Isaac, or Israel, or David, or anybody. There were no biblical writings at that time. Now, scholars, when these papyri were discovered, they freaked out. They said, these were some weird, heterodox, uh, <laughs> uh, oddball, weird Jews who practiced their own strange customs. Oh, oh, yeah, except that they were in communication to Jonathan, the high priest of Jerusalem, and his brothers. So, no, that was ordinary Judaism of its day, and it knew nothing of a biblical text. There was no Bible in 400 BC. And that's after the books of Moses were finished, J, E, D, P, and H, according to the doc documentary hypothesis. But yeah, none, of those, not a mention? none of those sources uh, appear in at all. Didn't happen. You say, um, just to read is something you wrote. This is fascinating. I love this elephantine thing. This is archaeology at its best, guys. I really like this. Most of these were letters that they found, legal documents, supply accounts, and the like. But one, number 21, contained an order from Darius II in 419 BCE to the Jews at Elephantine enjoining them to observe the days of unleavened bread, while a second series, NOS.2730-34, documented the Egyptian destruction of a Jewish temple at Yeb in 411 BCE and the fruitless efforts of the colonists during the years 410-407 BCE to secure permis or permission, sorry, to have it rebuilt. And you say that you think it might have been because they were possibly sacrificing animals uh, that uh, the Egyptians held sacred even. And these guys are like, well, we got to keep our sacrifices going. Um, they had pretty much what I counted is that you say this is oral tradition at best, just like those tablets, uh, the uh, the silver uh, amulets. But um, of over 160 Jews at Elephantine mentioned in the papyri, not one name comes in from the Pentateuch. Nor is there any reference in the papyri to the Exodus or any other biblical event, reference to laws of Moses or other authoritative writings. It's entirely absent. There is perplex. It's there is. Ah, this is perplexing since the priests supervising the Jewish temple at Elephantine should have possessed and enforced the Jewish Torah, which, according to the documentary hypotheses, was complete and promulgated as authoritative during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. And you say, A. Cowley commented succinctly on the complete lack of evidence for use or knowledge of the Pentateuch at Elephantine. What pre precisely constituted a Kahin priest at Elephantine does not appear. One of their prerogatives, we might suppose, would be to possess the law of Moses and to administer it. Yet there's no hint of its existence. We should expect that in 30.25, I think he's referencing something in the papyri, they would say, offer sacrifice according to our law. And that in other places, they would say, they would make some allusion to it. But there is none, zilch. So far as we lean, Leam, L E A M, from the these texts, Moses might never have existed. I think it meant learn. I might have yes. butchered a word. Mm -hmm. There might have been no bondage in Egypt, no exodus, no monarchy, no prophets. There is no mention of other tribes and no claim to any heritage in the land of Judah. Among the numerous names of colonists, Abraham, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Samuel, David, so common in later times never occur, nor in Nehemiah, nor any other name derived from their past history as recorded in the Pentateuch and earlier or early literature. It is almost incredible, uh, but it's true. And I had to read that because that's, I mean, nothing. It's a great summary. Great quote. Yeah, nothing. And this is something you're saying, guys, it would have been screamed from here that we'd had more than just unleavened bread traditions or the fact that they practiced sacrifice or the fact that they were temple ritualists that had a temple like that was common. It, even people without writing, even people without their constitution, <laughs> got to read his Plato in the Hebrew Bible to really get where this all comes in. Um, you know, they all there are people who practice this stuff throughout antiquity and did not. We don't we'd heard something, I would suspect.
Well, uh, when the Elephantine papyri were discovered, it was a scandal, like Cowley uh, in that passage that you read. And really is taken clear into the 21st century uh, for scholars to recognize that, well, this just means that they didn't have a Bible then. This was normal Judaism. It was pre-biblical. Um, the uh, an author named Granarod. He he's written a whole book on the Elephantine papyri and just taking it as at face value as this is what Judaism was at the time. Same is true in Babylon. Um, they had polytheism there, and it was just normal. Um, there was a there was a temple of uh, Yahweh in uh, Idumea in Edom. Um, at a late date also. They had multiple temples, polytheism, no biblical writings. That was just the way it was. Mm. Um, and that really creates an earliest possible date right there. Uh, the, the books of Moses had to be written after 400 BC uh, the, with the latest of the Elephantine papyri. Uh, and that's later than the documentary hypothesis allows. Wow. So we're stuck right now. If you're watching the series, we're stuck with this enigma code called the Elephantine Papyri and the archaeology backing such such a theory. And what we're going to do is what we've gone down to the 400s. Let's stick at the 400s for any of you skeptics like me out there who want to challenge and test this theory not only do i recommend you get the book okay but stay tuned to the series because we're going to open up in the next episode and talk about this guy named manitho and this guy named barosis let me rephrase that this priest named manitho and this priest named barosis very important figures that are doing the same thing if if i will um that what was required of the Jews to come do with their holy supposed books uh, and get it into the Septuagint. They're translating their history, if you will, into Greek. So the common man can understand the story from Egypt, the story from Babylon, the story from where, where's the Jews story? Ah, ah, it's coming. It's coming. So make sure you guys stay tuned, get the book. Russell Gamerican, do you have any closing statements you'd like to make on what we did in this episode? Well, um, it, first off, it was very enjoyable. And uh, you asked very smart questions. You've really read my book. And uh, and you quoted all the best passages from it. Um, but really what we've established in this episode is a kind of a scandal. The old 20th century scholarship and earlier that just read the Bible and said, well, it must be really old. And it was written back in uh, ancient times for the Greeks, that doesn't hold water anymore. Um, we need to look at later times. Uh, and there's plenty of overlooked evidence that uh, the Jews knew Greek writings and used them a lot. During the 20th century and earlier, they never even looked at Greek writings. Why? Because they assumed that the Bible was written before Alexandria. So it's circular reasoning. If it was written that early, you don't need to pay attention to the later Greek writings. You don't even need to look at them. They're irrelevant. Well, I don't believe they're irrelevant. I think that they provide a smoking gun as to when and where the books of Moses were written. And uh, I'll be very delighted to get into that in our next episode in this series. Guys, get ready. Buckle up. Get ready. We're going to launch off. We're in the 400s right now. Give them the benefit of the doubt here. I mean, we're in the Elephantine papyri phase. So we're right here. We realize that it can't be any older than this period. Or we need some facts. We need some real facts to base this on. And we have nothing. So right now, I'm in the 450s with you, 400-ish BCE. And he's going to have to convince us, Manitho and Barosis, and take us 
closer towards the Hellenistic area with the Alexandrian phase, if you will, the Alexandrian library. He's going to have to take us there. So thank you for joining me. And I look forward to us digging deep into your book, Barosis and Genesis, Manitho and Exodus. So thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure. And don't forget, we are Myth Vision. Thank you.